the fleece looking? How's your fleece looking? Do you have a fleece? What's a fleece? Kind of a, yeah, a sheep kind of hide, right? And it has on one side of it just kind of like the leather, and on the other side it has kind of the sheep uh, wool, right? And it's so, I should have brought one with me. But picture this, this, this chunk of leather, and... Uh, <laughs> I was going to pull off my shoe and show you some leather, but my shoes aren't leather. But uh, So picture a piece of leather, but this isn't just a piece of leather. Actually, I've got a piece of leather. i got a piece of leather right here. There it is on my Bible. So there's a piece of leather, but this leather on the inside and outside, it's kind of smooth. But... In that case, it was smooth on one side and fuzzy on the other side, a, like a lamb. And there it was. And so how many of you ever gone to people's house, and maybe it was a cabin, a lot of times it's a cabin, and they have like a, a bear skin on the floor. Anybody seen anything like that? Yeah, yeah. And it's kind of, it could be, depends on how you're thinking about that. It kind of could be a little creepy. Yeah, a little freaky. But there it is. And so you can just kind of feel the fur of the bear and stuff. Well, in this case, it was just a, a sheepskin that had the fuzz on one side. And, and in this story that God impressed me to study into this week and to share with you guys today, I feel like there's a message here for us. I feel like there's a time that we're living in that isn't totally disconnected from the time that this man named Gideon was living in. Let's dive in. Let's go to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. And we're going to pick up the story right here. And it, uh, we're going to dive in a little bit of reading about what the country was like back then. And it starts right off by saying, And the children of Israel, verse 1, The children of Israel did what? Evil. Evil. In the sight of who? Lord. The Lord. Who's watching us all the time? God is. We are accountable 24-7 to God. Who's watching us? And it says there that uh, Israel, children of Israel, did evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord then did something in response to that. What did he do? He delivered them up into the hands of Midian. Were, was that a good thing? No. The Midianites were the enemy, and they were serving all these pagan gods, and, and which aren't gods. And they were just doing all this worship and pagan worship. And, and so God said, you know what? If you're going to go against me, if you're going to sin against me, try it without me. Go try it without me. See what life is like without me. What's life without God? Is it a good thing? Lots of people try it. Lots of people try to just kind of go on their own, do whatever they want, whatever feels good, and they seem to be happy. A lot of times when you see them, if it's online or if it's in person or something, and they seem kind of happy and they try to tell you only the happy things, but down deep, there's something missing. And without God, you won't have true happiness. 
And so, even in our lives, as we have friends and family members that are going against God, for us to be praying for God to just bless them tremendously, not sure how well that works. Because God has ways of drawing people back to him, and it's maybe not so comfortable. And in this case, God is doing that right here. God is allowing them to go into some trials. So sometimes we need to understand that the trials that we're going through, it might be for our best interest. And we can be asking God, why are you allowing this to happen? And it says, in the hand of Midian, verse 2, prevailed against Israel, and because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them the dens which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come to Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass, for they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers as multitudes. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Stop grasshoppers. I haven't ever seen grasshoppers come in like crazy, but I've watched it on TV or something. I've seen documentaries of grasshoppers, and they just come in just in so many millions of these things, and they just come into a beautiful crop, and in moments, days, it's gone, just destroyed, ate up, nasty, how do you stop the little buggers? I don't know. You'd think that they would figure that out. Man, these things, and all of a sudden, it can just kind of almost become dark in the sky because of the numbers of these things. And this is the way it was with the Midianites. So here you are, one of God's people of Israel, and you're just doing your thing. You're minding your own business but you're a suppressed people. Even so much as it says that you are seeking a home in a cave. This is not the great condition to live in. And then you're still planting. You're still getting ready for a harvest. You're, I've watched my wife take such good care of our garden. She's an amazing woman, amazing homesteader, I would call her. And she just, her little pumpkins are like her little children. I mean, and she just takes such good care of them to the corn, to the tomatoes, to the potatoes. And she dug some potatoes yesterday. And she's just digging those potatoes and bringing bowls of potatoes up to our house. She made us a breakfast of potatoes and, and chopped peppers and all these different things. And all of this was from our garden. It was beautiful. So she got to work so hard this summer and then reap that, and then she got to enjoy it with me. I got to enjoy it too. It was beautiful, and David and stuff, and, and it was just beautiful. But wait, that's not the case here. Israel sowed, did all this, and then they went to reap it, and the Midianites just came in like grasshoppers. And they just ate it all up. And left Israel with about nothing. That's horrible. I can't imagine how disheartened you would be. How frustrated you would be. And you're, as your gut is telling you, you're hungry... And yet, 
there's nothing to eat, it would be easy to get to the point where they were. And it said in verse 6, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Does God hear us when we cry? How much do we cry to God? How much do we even need God? Right now, are we feeling like Israel back then, or are we feeling pretty, living pretty large? We got... We do. We need to cry often and daily and every moment. I agree with you, my brother there. And I just hear these cries. They come up to God. The Father that is looking down on his children. And it says in verse 7, and it came to pass. When the, disciple, or when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt. I brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and I drave them out from before you. And gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods, little g, of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But ye have not obeyed my voice. This is a key. This is a major key. I feel. A major takeaway is why did God allow them to be suppressed by the Midianites? Because they didn't heed God's word. They didn't obey his voice. Why don't people obey God? Some of it is probably because it's, well, what's God's voice? What's God's word? What, what is he asking me to do? And it's easy to just kind of, if you're not studying what that is from his word, it's easy to just then kind of take what everybody else says about what is God's voice and what's God's direction, and we just do that. But are there false teachers in this world? Lots of them. That are saying, thus saith the Lord, da da da, and it's not. And it's going to get really dicey, like we kind of talked about last Sabbath. It's going to get a little dicey, a lot dicey. Because at some point, God's people, in the end, are going to become such a minority. And the majority are going to follow after this figurative beast, power. So we've got to figure out how do we distinguish between the false and God's voice here. Because I don't want to be in this category of that very last line of 10, but ye have not obeyed my voice. That's not the category I want to be in. I want to be in that category that is the opposite of that. These people over here, God's remnant, have obeyed my voice. That's the one I want to be in. Things are getting crazy in this world. I don't know if you're noticing some things. There is even a time of suppression coming that is going to, I believe, make God's people feel a lot like this, this condition here. There's even people that have agendas. I don't know if you ever heard of a 20, or 2030 agenda. 2030 agenda. There's a whole group of uh, businesses and stuff that have come together as a World Economic Forum. WEP 
And they are headed up, interestingly, the, the whole uh, Pope of Rome has kind of set up this World Economic Forum to create a whole group of the most powerful people in the universe, in, not the universe, in this planet, to then get to the point where they can control everything. And if you don't follow suit with their whole 2030 agenda, it won't go so well for you. What's interesting is they talk about in this, uh, these plans of even a potential, we'll see, I'm not trying to throw out any predictions, but in 2022, the summer of that, a great famine. Hmm, what's coming? God knows. Do we have to be fearful for the future? Absolutely not. But we can be students of God's word. We can be studying and learning what's to come to pass according to his prophecies. And we can know ahead of time what's going to happen. And we can then know how to prepare. And we can learn from his stories like this here to cry unto God and actually ask God, what do you want me doing? Because in these times that we're living, that can seem so, right now, maybe not so challenging like these times of Gideon's time. Here we are. Your name, none of your name, is Gideon. Some may be online. Watch this. Maybe your name is Gideon. I don't know. But this man Gideon, he was just like you. Just hanging out, trying his best to be a good man and a good person and, and just survive. And yet... We're about to see that God was about to totally make a presence in his life. Is God about to do that in your life? What great and amazing things does God have for you and me to do? I don't know. Check this out. Let's go on to the rest of the story. Verse 11. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash, the Abarzarite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. What do you picture there? There's Gideon. There he is. He's hanging out in a little wine press, and I don't know why, I just always picture this little wine press thing, <coughs> excuse me, as like a, like a shack. I don't know, maybe it's more glorious than that. But I picture this as like this shack with these old barn boards and stuff, and, and not all sealed up tight, these just barn boards, and, and how many of you ever been in a barn? All right. How many have been to the top of a barn? How many of you ever put hay up in the top of a barn? Wow, a lot of you. Most of you on this side. I'm not sure why. But so, sure enough, you're putting hay up there. And boy, I tell you, when I was a young man, I just, I would get dying at the top of the barn for something. I'm dying for something. And, and water, yeah but especially fresh air. I am so looking for fresh air. And, and so I would look for the biggest crack in the side of the barn boards. And I would literally suck my face right up to that barn boards. And I would try to suck fresh air from the outside in. Because inside here, is all disturbed and there's just this dust and you can see the sunlight coming through and it's just this dust all in the air and you know you're just breathing that stuff in. I don't know. Going back to Gideon, 
I picture this wine press, this little building, kind of like that with these slat boards and stuff, but there's kind of, you can see through them and stuff, and, and there he is. He's threshing a little wheat that he'd gathered, and he's tummy is kind of rumbling and he's just trying to make some food for him and his family and and all the while I think your ears are turned all the way up you're listening for the slightest little crack <coughs> maybe that's a Midianite or a Malachite could I come and steal my my wheat and you're looking through those little barn door, little slats, and you're just looking for the slightest little thing. You're looking kind of way off, too, in the distance. See if there's anything coming. And there's Gideon in this state. And it says here, thank you so much. It says here that uh, in a little um, message from Patriarchs and Prophets, Gideon was the son of Joash, of the tribe of Manasseh. The division to which this family belonged held no leading position. But the household of Joash was distinguished for two things. Get this. The household of Joash, the dad of Gideon, was distinguished for courage and integrity. Wow. Is that two traits that you'd like for your home to be known for? Courage and integrity. So, continuing on, as Gideon is threshing wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites, verse 12 says, And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him, and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. What? Here's Gideon, and he's just kind of hiding out, and he's grinding a little wheat, threshing a little wheat, and he's just kind of looking. Does he look like a mighty man of valor? No way! This guy looks so tail between his legs, scared. Ah! So why did the angel of the Lord say that to him? Oh, yes. He could see beyond this current position that he's in and see what Gideon was going to become with God. And that's beautiful. And that's what God is seeing in each and every one of you and me. What we can become with him and his strength. What we're going to accomplish with him and his strength. Oh, to hear those words. Jeffrey, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Mary, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty woman of valor. What would that be like? But that's what I believe God is telling us today. Today. Because God has plans for each and every one of us. It's awesome stuff. Verse 13 continues on. And Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all the, his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Do you hear a little whining going on there? A little complaining? It's like you got an angel of the Lord right in front of you. And you're going to start complaining? Ah, oh, that's all right. God's patient. Do you like that God is patient with you? I do. 
Oh. And verse 14 says, And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? Go in this thy might. It sounds like God is going to just give us the might that we need to go in. And we got to always remember who's sending us. It's God. And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Do you hear whining almost again? It's like, come on, look. God is telling you he's going to do a mighty work through you, and yet you're just trying to come up with excuses? It reminds me of a throwback of Moses and Moses at the burning bush, and I'm not a good speaker. I can't do that, what you're calling me to do. God is never going to call us to do something that he doesn't give us everything we need to accomplish it. God is never going to call you to do something. He's not going to give you everything you need to accomplish it. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. The key game changer in the whole picture is God with you. That's the game changer. All of a sudden, it's not putting it on you. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's not about Gideon. It's about God, the God of Gideon, the God of Israel. So, skipping on down, and uh, it... Uh, he ends up um, making the angel, he asked him to be patient, and make him, he went and made him some food, and he came on back, and the angel touched it with a staff, and shoo, the stone just lit up everything and just consumed it. And uh, verse 22, skipping down, down, and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, alas, O oh, Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not. Thou shalt not die. <laughs> it's like, okay. Gideon's like, I get it. I'm not in the presence of just anyone and God says unto him, Peace be unto thee. Fear not. How often do we need to hear God say that to us? How often do we get freaked out, worried, concerned, what's going to happen for the future? Yeah. <laughs> if we're going to be honest, yes. It's like, and here's God saying, peace be unto thee, fear not. That's verse 23. Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom unto this day, and yet is an Ophrah. And, uh, and 25 says, And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altars of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. Uh-oh. What's about to happen here? God is calling him now to save Israel from the Midianites. But wait. There's some cleanup there's some prerequisites that need to have to happen here. Because God can't 
powerfully move through you and use you in a powerful manner if you've got sin in your life. If you're sold out to Satan, if you're actually got things in your life that are of Satan, and you're hanging on to these things, God can't powerfully move through you while you're hanging on to these things. And so God sees that they're worshiping Baal, and they've got this big Baal statue, and that they've got these groves set up as prayer groves to these Baal and other gods, little g's. And God says, before I use you and God's people to save all of you, you got to go tear down that, that Baal, that big image of Baal. And you got to take down those groves. You got to clean some house. You got to get that stuff out of your life. Oh, and if you read the story, he, he said, okay, I'll do it. And he went and grabbed, got some of his buddies and, and uh, and God was even very specific, wasn't he, on what bullock even to take. It's like, is our God a specific God? Yes. Some people say, does it really matter what day you go to worship on? God says he set aside one day out of seven, his Sabbath. He put special sauce, lettuce, cheese on that day. If you don't think it's a special day, take that up with God. Here, here Gideon it was even told, even take the second bullock of seven years old. Huh. God is specific. And so sure enough, Gideon does what he's asked to do, but God didn't tell him to do it during the day. <laughs> and so he did it during the night because he was kind of scared of what people would say of him tearing down this big altar of Baal and uh, tearing out this grove. And uh, sure enough, the next morning when the people rose up and they saw that Baal had been torn down and all this stuff, and it's like, what in the world? Who just did this? And you can't keep it a secret. And somebody squealed on Gideon and said, oh, that's Gideon. And oh, man, and they went to get Gideon and wanted to kill him and stuff. And, and they came unto uh, my Gideon's dad. And verse 30 says, then the men of the city said unto Joash, Gideon's dad, Bring out thy son, that he may die, because he has cast down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the grove that was by it. <laughs> and some things in the Bible make me smile. This does. Verse 31 and 32, Joash, the dad of Gideon, his response makes me smile. And Joash said, Unto all that stood against him, will ye plead for Baal? Will you save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one has cast down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he called him Jerubbabel saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down his altar. He's basically saying, you know what? If Baal's a god, let him plead for himself. I love it. Sure enough, Gideon then, the story concludes. By then, Gideon rallies some troops. And uh, verse 34 says, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon, and he blew a trumpet. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Gideon. What's it like to have the Spirit of God come upon us? I think that's something we can be praying for and pleading for, that God would pour his spirit out upon us individually and even as a church and raise us up in his strength to accomplish all that he has for us to accomplish. 
What is that? I don't know. What's God's plans for you individually? I don't know. What's God's plans for your family? I don't know. What's God's plans for this little church of his? I've got some ideas, but I don't know. But I'm longing for God to accomplish it all in his strength. In verse 36, skipping down, it says, And Gideon said unto God, If thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said, behold, I will put a fleece of wool in the flour. And if the dew be on the fleece only, and it be dry upon the earth beside, then shall I know that thou wilt save Israel by mine hand, as thou hast said. It's like God's already calling him, but he needs a sign. I love that God is patient with us. And God says, okay, that's not a problem. And so he lays out this fleece, and he leaves the fur up, and he says, you know, if that fleece is wet, but everything around it is dry, I'll know that you're with me. Sure enough, you think it was a little hard for him to go to sleep that night? Do you think he maybe laid right beside that fleece and maybe every once in a while reached out and just kind of touched it? I don't know. Maybe. Sure enough, the next morning he woke up and I think the first thing on his mind was, the fleece! And he was probably like, Goo. because you know you wrestle with your faith, right? In God, you wrestle with that. You're just like, do I have faith in God? And he went and looked and, and he touched that fleece. Soggy. Mm. You squish it and water just kind of squishes through your fingers and you're just like, oh. Around it, it's dry. Oh, God's with me. And yet, his mind went, ooh, rationalizing, analyzing, and you're just like, wait a minute. That might not be the ultimate test. Oh, why didn't I think of that? And then he goes to the Lord and said, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. Abba, he says in verse 39, let not thine anger be hot against me, and I will speak just this once. Let me prove, I pray thee, but this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry only on the fleece, and upon the ground let there be dew. And God, in his patience, it's okay. I can be patient with you, Gideon, because I've got great plans for you. And sure enough, he goes to sleep. Does he start feeling, I don't know. And he wakes up the next morning. And sure enough, he goes and feels that fleece, and it's completely just bone dry. He's like, oh. And he feels around it, and it's all damp and dewy. And I guarantee he got dew on his knees as he bowed before the Lord on his knees and he surrendered his life to him to be used by God to do whatever God had for him to do. What was that? God raised him up and had him go grab a bunch of people to go and fight the Midianites. And God used Gideon to rally a ton of people. And yet, your Bible says right there in verse, chapter 7, verse 2, And the Lord said unto Gideon, You done too good of a job. That's John Lanfear's paraphrase. It says, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Why? Why? Why did God say you got too many? 
It says, because lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, mine hand has saved me. God is so wanting us to trust him completely and not trust ourselves. We have got to get out of this state of trusting self. And we've got to get fully surrendered to God and trusting in him and him only to save us. So how's your fleece? Do you have a fleece? Are you wondering, does God have special plans for me? Are you even asking those questions? As we come into a time that I believe is going to try our faith in God like never, ever in our entire lives, I think these are the times like never before for us as an individual to be asking God, what are the plans you have for me? What do I need to be doing to build my faith in you, to then trust in you to accomplish everything you have for me? Is God going to impress you to get a fleece? Or is it going to be something else, more modern? Are we willing to ask God for a test? Or does that make us scared? Because what if he doesn't answer? And it completely destroys our faith. I had a new friend of mine said that when he was a late teenager, he had grown up in the church and, and he kind of had fallen away from God. And he got to the point where he was looking at the stars of the heavens. And he said, Lord, if you are real, Please let a shooting star shoot across the sky. And all of a sudden, and he was like, whoa, that was pretty immediate. But that, just like Gideon, he thought, it could have just happened. Oh, Lord, he prayed a second time. If you're truly real, please let a second shooting star shoot across the sky. And all of a sudden, and he was like, whoa, oh Lord, the chances of two shooting stars right when I ask for them. It's just unmistakable. But Lord, please, if you're really real, let just a third star shoot across the sky. And he said, all of a sudden, John, there is this humongous star went all the way across the sky. And he said, I was so humbled. And from that moment on, my faith in God has been so real. I want to challenge this. That God has great and mighty plans for us. Individually in this church. And he needs us to be right now asking him to show us how real he is and the plans that he has for us. 
And I can't wait to see what he's going to do through each one of you and me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your story of Gideon in your Bible. Thank you so much for this, this young man that was scared for his life, even sulking, wondering why you had abandoned them. And yet he had no idea that, God, you were about to answer all of their prayers through him. He was the one. He was living in the moment when you were about to answer all of their prayers. And you were going to use him in a mighty way to save your people and especially save their faith in you. Here we are, Lord, a people not knowing what the time is that we're living in exactly, but things are wrapping up quickly and things are going to get rough. You predict it. And we long to have the faith in you that's needed to get through everything that's ahead and to accomplish everything you have for us to do as individuals, as young people, as parents, as grandparents, as people in your church, what do you have for us to do, Lord? Please reveal your plans to us. Save us, Lord. Save your people. Raise up your church, Lord, to accomplish all that you have for us to accomplish. Give us your visions. And give us everything we need to accomplish it. Lord, if there's any sin in our lives, in the church, anything that needs to go, please reveal that to us and help us to get that out of our lives so that we can be pure and holy for you to move mightily through us for your honor and glory. Thank you. Love you, Lord. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.